What's up, you guys? It's your girl Erica from Just Stop Profits. Listen, we have on our options trading expert, Diamond Dave. And this week, we're kind of going over what we saw in the stock market and things to be wary of and things to prepare ourselves for and earnings and you name it. So without further ado, introduce yourself, Mr. David. How are you doing, Erica? Really happy to be here. So my name is David W. Williams, also known as Diamond Dave. I'm the founder of a course called The Highest Paid Part-Time Job in a Run Options Trading Course. Uh, and I'm really, really happy to be here to kind of talk about what happened in the market this week and what we think is going to be coming up. And so to really go right into it is that what we saw over the past five days was that the SPY ETF was really, really choppy, uh, a mm -hmm. lot of volatility. And I anticipated it to be a lot more stable uh, because we had a lot of earnings coming out this week. And I thought that the market would respond favorably to those earnings. However, I want to say probably on Thursday, I believe uh, information came out that Biden is potentially going to raise the tax rate. Right to try to finance a lot of the infrastructure spending that he is planning to do. Uh, and one of the reasons with the reaction from the market to that was a sell off a little bit around early afternoon to late afternoon on that particular day. So what we saw was a lot of volatility in the spy, a lot of volatility in the other um, major indexes. And what we want to kind of look for is that is that volatility going to swing into this early week coming in? Because I know Biden is supposed to be speaking on the 28th, it's supposed to give a lot more concrete details on how he's going to finance this infrastructure uh, planning. And then once we can get some of that uncertainty out of the market, we might start going back directionally bullish or the market may feel that they are perceiving his information as negative and then the market might be going bearish. So I think that we may be in a maybe a wait and see pattern until the 28th in which he speaks. But we also have some really, really big earnings coming out this week. I think Tesla's reporting on Monday. I know Apple's also reporting. I know Amazon's reporting. Uh, I believe Microsoft may be reporting. Uh, a lot of the really big stocks in the QQQ, which is kind of like the NASDAQ ETF, are reporting. And so we want to kind of see, combined with Biden talking about how he's going to finance this infrastructure plan, how is the market going to respond to that? And in what direction do we think the market is going to take as a result? Does the market usually respond positively when we have like infrastructure bills? Because it is kind of a future growth kind of thing. Does the market usually respond well or just certain sectors? I think it depends on how the market responds just to the news. So the kind of is how do we think people perceive that this particular bill is going to be for one, the companies that are in the S&P 500, the Dow and the Nasdaq, and then also the overall economy. So one thing we got to understand about the market is that their perception of something good, it may not necessarily be correlated with the overall economy. I think the infrastructure bill will eventually be beneficial for the overall economy. But the market want to kind of understands are there companies in the market that can take advantage of us? So I wouldn't say Caterpillar, exactly Cologne. Caterpillar. Yeah, everybody. I mean, even like if you could find companies that are publicly traded that sell things like nails, like hardware, equipment, yeah. things of that nature. So I think they will be bullish on it historically because they could drive a lot of revenue. But at the same time is they want to kind of understand how is this bill going to get funded and then how do they feel about it at this particular time? So we kind of want to come look at it from a comprehensive standpoint. Good, 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 good. So, so what is some of the future towards Tesla and Apple? I mean, to me, I don't see anything new coming out of Apple other than movies, I guess, okay. on their streaming yeah. platform. I mean, that's just me because I'm not an Apple, uh, you know, like, oh, I got to get the latest Apple iPhone. I'm just an Android person. Um, but I can see Tesla because I'm here in Austin. They're building okay. a factory. And then I see more Teslas in the marketplace. Now, the other day, someone was like, well, Erica, electric cars are only 1% of the market. But uh -huh. I see multiple cities making new laws and new bills that they're going completely electric in like the next five years. Um, as far as city vehicles or uh, the government issued vehicles being electric, it's almost like when I was in Alabama, I would see like Ford uh, and I'd see Ty Hope, like two different, depending on the city or state you're in, I mean, the city or you were in Alabama. You had a bunch of tie hopes, like the whole police force, all tie hopes. Well, then okay. you go over to the another town and then they had all Ford products. So I almost feel like if you get some of these cities and states going, hey, we're going all electric vehicle. Who wins that? I feel like Tesla wins it unless there's another company I'm just not seeing. OK, and that's really good. So let me talk about what you said last, because I think that's really, really important, because there was a company called Workhorse and they were, mm -hmm. I think, putting out like a light uh, truck that's supposed to be either EV based or hydrogen based, but I believe it was EV based. Their whole value proposition was that we're going to get a United States Postal Service contract. Uh, right. The problem is that that didn't happen because I believe Ford is going to get that contract. Mm -hmm. So what we want to look at is that Tesla. Yes, they have a lot of name and notoriety in the EV space. They were kind of like a first move in that space. Right. Mm 
-hmm. but we still have the old school car manufacturers that have still have the very, very deep political relationships. Yeah. So if we're talking about these political institutions like fleet centers, fleets, fleets for um, uh, the sheriff's department, for postal service, for county and, and, and other type services like where I'm at in Florida, our fleet historically has always been Chevy. Mm -hmm. So you understand that our sheriff's department pretty much has already swung to a Chevy for their fleet. Um, if they have the historical manufacturers and they now donate a, a percentage of their car manufacturing to EV, are they going to be more in line to get that, to get those deals in Tesla? Right. So what I see with Tesla is that they're really going hard after the private space. But the old school car manufacturers, because they have those relationships that already currently exist, as the government agencies move more towards EV, to me, they're more in line to get those contracts because the relationships already exist. Makes sense, makes sense. Yes, ma'am. So some of the things that we've been looking at is Kathy Woods, right? Like she's the darling yeah. of the internet the past couple of weeks. Is there some things she's been talking about lately that are, are moving the market or or they're just making a big splash on the media side? I mean, I wouldn't necessarily, what she does moves the market. She gets a lot of media attention. So what she did talk about, and we've known that she's very bullish on the genome space. And she believes that that's gonna be the future of medicine. And I 100 percent agree with her, even though I necessarily don't necessarily agree that it's genome mapping to me. What I think the future of, of the medical space is going to be peptides. All right. But a lot of people are not are not hip to the peptide space yet because it pretty much comes out of the sports performance world. But I think eventually that's going to move towards mainstream. So she's very big on genome. And that's kind of like how do we uh, screen out genomes for di disease prevention and also disease curing? And she has an EDF called the ARKG, which is like her genome ETF. Mm -hmm. uh, the biggest challenge I would tell anybody that wants to invest in this, and this is not going to be investment advice, I'm not a fiduciary, is that you want to really understand the business model of the company, because as that space becomes hotter, a lot of people are going to present themselves as having a, a idea or a business model to take advantage of this particular space, but doesn't mean that they actually have a real business around it. And what is going to be some of the R&D spend that's going to have to be spent to create solutions? So we look at traditional pharmaceuticals. A lot of pharmaceutical companies just spend a lot of money, but they never come up with a drug. And so what happens is you can invest in them and they're never able to get to creating a drug and then getting that drug to prove where they can take it to market. Yeah. The same thing with this genome situation. What actual products or solutions or services are they going to be able to create? Are they going to be able to brought to market? Will they be able to develop relationships with people that want to utilize or license those? So it still comes back to what is their business model? How do they make money? Who are their customer base? What is their customer concentration? The old school business things don't go away because it's a new uh, kind of like a space age type environment that we're working in now. Well, you know, there was a show on, uh, gosh, was it CW or is it, it might be the other channel, uh, TBS. And the guy okay. was a doctor for the rich and he would go okay. to their house and they would call him on this number. And everybody was like, oh, that's so silly because he was a sports doctor. And I'm okay. like, no, that's right now. The future is now like uh, our friend fell down a, a flight of stairs in Houston. We laid him in the bed. We called telehealth to the to the house. Okay. No one was taking him anywhere. They came with a machine. They took pictures of the ankle, all different places. Um, they put like a little semi cast on it, a light one, till he got to the location. And okay. they could have get did the whole thing there because the guy was like, "Oh, I can see from the picture, this bad." But he was like, "No, I'm gonna put a light cast on it so you can go to the specialist in the office." Okay. I see that as a big future space. Because the last couple of conferences I've been to, telehealth, there are people who already have the platform set up. They literally tell me, we just don't have enough doctors. Yeah. So we don't have enough doctors. We don't have enough people we're connecting with to um, make, the, make the connections. So it's like they have all this technology that's ready, but is the marketplace ready for it? Right. Yeah, I would have yeah. thought with, with the virus, more people would have been like, oh, I don't want to go to the hospital. Somebody can come to me. Yeah. Right. So, um, so I understand it's hard with the medical for people to see it, but like if it if it starts being on TV, it's like, hey, you guys, that's like that's a real life thing. Doctors actually come to you, and they make more money doing so than being stuck in a hospital. Yeah, definitely, definitely. And I think, like you said, as you see it on TV, and then once you start, it becomes in people have like the telemedicine. So a lot of doctors now that I was talking to after COVID were telling you, well, we also now have added in a virtual appointment. You know, well, historically, you couldn't get that. Now, for some pharmaceutical drugs, they allowed you to get prescribed without actually having to see a doctor in person. Mm -hmm. And so I think a lot of people coming out of that space are now saying, well, you know what, if I have something that's minor and I just need to get a minor prescription, it's better for me to speak to a doctor virtually 
get that service and not having to spend time in a waiting room, things of that nature. I can just see them online. And then over time, it's just going to become more and more fluid. So, you know, you know, because I know you really understand business. The medical space is essentially an evergreen space. It's just where do we continue to take this space and, and figure out new applications and new processes? And really what it really comes down to is where are the insurance companies going to allow us to take these spaces? Because essentially they have to underwrite, right? Everybody doing business in this particular space, unless you just want to go 100 percent private. Man, and one of the big things I thought about when I was listening to the guy talk about telehealth is South Carolina, for example. They have all these people coming there to retire at a higher rate than Florida because it's a smaller yeah. state. They, they're not. And they basically said, hey, we haven't even prepared people for the past 20 years to take care of all this graying, older South Carolina folk. We haven't. We didn't yeah. make an economy for it. But we made an economy for tourism. And so yeah. now they're trying to figure out how to retrain all these people in the health just to do the the intermediary stuff, not like the doctor or the nurse, but like patient care, get you to surgical techs, like just in between stuff. And I see that's going to happen in telehealth where there's going to be a guy or girl. They drive the white van and they drive the little x-ray machine or they drive certain parts to someone's house, but they're not the official doctor. Um, exactly. I, I have to see that being a buffer in the future. OK, I think Kingston James was talking about electric vehicles here. Uh, people who are in the electric vehicle space. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, I think like so. Ford, Hyundai, Neo. Yeah, Neo's also doing reporting this week too. Yeah, so it, earning earnings is a great time. It seems like it, but again, so this is a big. This is a multi question, so we're going to have to break it up. Okay. Uh, great show. As an options trader, do you personally focus on intraday market movement, or do you focus on larger time frame? And then there's another question. OK, so the first question, I focus on both. So I look at intraday. So I do look at how the actual stock is moving that day, especially if I'm looking to make an entry. So that's mm -hmm. also very important. So let me give an example. I entered into a trade on um, Nicola. Right. So we know that's a pretty much beat down stock. Um, they're going to have an issue coming up this week in which their float is going to expand potentially by a lot of shares. Like they're going to get a massive expansion in the float, which I believe is going to push their share price down. They were at a particular price during the day in which I would not have entered. What happened is a piece of news came out about that particular stock. It drove that price up around two dollars. That became a good entry point for me now, because what I can do now is just play the downside. But because they're two dollars up, this farther that they can fall down. Mm -hmm. So I do focus on intraday movement, but it's a case by case scenario. In some scenarios, I don't. As soon as I wake up in the morning, I go ahead and take a position because I'm looking at a longer time frame. So I do also focus on longer time frames, which we call swing trades, which is something that people uh, on the poll said that they wanted to get more information on. So then if I'm looking at a longer time frame, the initial entry is not going to be as important because I know I'm going to stay in a lot longer. So it's all really a case by case scenario and where I really think that that entry fits for that particular scenario. Then how long do I typically stay in options trades? The same thing is a case by case scenario. Um, I'm not a big weekly guy, so I don't necessarily buy weekly contracts. Those are contracts that expire in seven days or less. I rarely scout, which I really buy a contract and try to get out that same day. Uh, so I normally exceed seven days of my contracts and then everything by everything past that is a case by case scenario. But I would encourage anybody that is a novice option trader to try to stay in the trade as long as possible. And what I mean by that is to buy as much expiration as possible because it takes you a certain amount of expertise in the space to play really short time frames because you can get pushed out of your position really fast based on how the market moves. An example is that when it comes out that body is potentially going to raise the income tax rate, the market sold off. Mm -hmm. So if you had a contract that expired that Friday and then you sold off that fast, well, then you automatically have a contract that's probably going to be negative and you got an expiration date coming up that Friday. So that's the problem with shorter term time frame. So I would uh, encourage you to get some seasoning, get some experience and then start looking at shorter term time frames uh, in the market. The more time you have is always going to be better for you because you need time in the market and, and when you say time do you mean uh studying the market participating in the market or or what well you need all you need time studying the market mm -hmm. you need time actually in the market you need to get what i call season so you need some seasoning which is, means that you need to have gone through some market cycles some market uh patterns uh seen some seasons in the market and then also if you can buy i mean to be very frank with you the more time that you can buy on an option, the better it is for you. The problem is you got to pay for that. So you got to always factor in what the contract is going to cost you in regards to time. So if you can buy a year out, that's always better than you buying 90 days. But the problem is a year out is going to cost you more money. 
So then you got to factor in what do you believe the expected move is and then also factor that into your particular budget. But yeah, if you can buy more time, like we looked at the Nancy Pelosi contracts. She has contracts that are going out. She got people messed up. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. So that's the thing is that she bought a lot of time because she understands that it makes more sense for me to buy time if I have the money than to buy less time and to take the risk of being out of position. Mm -hmm. But she has the money. Well, and that's the thing. It's like, then everybody's like, well, what's going on in two years? Even though Nancy Pelosi may have just been doing a very wise business move, people are like, oh my God, something's going on two years from now. Um, so did you see how they tried to blame millennials and Gen Z for dumping uh, the return to normal stocks? I don't know if you saw that when they were talking about no. it. It was like American Airlines, Delta, United, uh, Carnival Cruises, Norway Cruises. And they're like, it's millennials dumping. And I'm like, y'all, <laughs> like, like you said, quarter three and quarter four, it was they were going to bring, you know, make some money. So they yeah. people sold. Uh, but I just thought it was funny how they tried to blame millennials. I was like, how that happened? Yeah, I feel, uh-huh. yeah, you know, they, they have this narrative that millennials and especially the um, the mobile app traders are kind of bad for the market. Mm-hmm. But it's just it gives it gives them something to try to focus on as opposed to what's actually going on behind the scenes. And mm-hmm. I'm, I'm all for it because it just creates more liquidity in the market. The more people that you can have in the market, the more liquidity it has, the more money moves around, the better it is for everybody else. You know, my my training is as an economist and I'm all about creating as much liquidity in the marketplace as possible. Mm-hmm. Yes, ma'am. Um. So some of the some of the stuff I'm kind of reading is saying Fang is losing its is losing its kind of steam, and you know what Fang is is Facebook, yes, but you know you already know, right? So yes, what are your thoughts on those? On because those are considered big tech stocks. Yeah, I mean what we saw uh, because of COVID is that a lot of people ran the Fang, right? They felt mm-hmm. that that was a safe place to put their money, and they felt like a lot of those stocks were going to be COVID resistant. And some of them would also benefit from COVID, like the Netflixes and the Amazons mm-hmm. and things of that nature. And they were 100% correct. However, I don't think they're overboard. What I think is that a lot of the growth that we've seen probably over the past 12 months may not be as great over these next 12 months because things are going to kind of stabilize and get back to normal. Now, when you're looking at a company like Amazon, I think they're only going to get bigger and better over time because I think that they're so good at what they do and they're yes, so good at better. pushing competitors. Exactly. They're only going to get better over time. But when we look at a company like Netflix that really benefited from of COVID, I was telling people is I think that their year to year comparables are not going to be as good because now this time last year, everybody was sheltered in because of COVID and was watching Netflix. So they were able to show really, really good subscriber numbers where this year it may not be the same because a lot of people are having to go back to work, things of that nature. So they're still going to be valuable companies. But what I said is that COVID created a lot of abnormal expectations for them that many of them may not be able to support. But then other ones like the Amazons, right? Are going to continue to just get better and better over time you, you know something that i um thought was so interesting this past week was that hbo max got a million subscribers exactly. right and 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 i had been one of those people that are like no people are going to go back to movie theaters well this past weekend there is no seats open for mortal kombat like we okay. were the last ticket holders <laughs> yeah. of the day. like every single show for the next i think six days is sold out so the, okay. the desire to go back to the movie theater is definitely there. But then I also thought like a million people rather pay, I don't know, $59 or a hundred bucks a month. But in my mind, I go HBO Max, even though they have like seven HBOs just made or going to make, let's say it's, let's say it's a hundred a month. Okay. They just made a hundred million a month. Yeah. Every month for a year, you know what I'm saying? Just the magnitude of the number just blew my mind. I was like, y'all, it's just not that serious. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Man, we're definitely still, in a new market. There's still, room, there's still room for people who want to go home, basically, is what I'm saying. Yeah, 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 definitely. I mean, what we're seeing now, and especially in the in the movie space, is that there's a new market to where the movie theaters now have to try to figure out where do they fit. Because with the HBO Max, is Disney doing direct, still, you still have Netflix. Um, how do they convince the the production houses to give them the movie? Mm-hmm. So they were successful in correct. I don't know who produced Mortal Kombat, but they were able to be successful in allowing them to get the movie to where we can actually see it in person, as opposed to it having just go straight to on demand platform. So now they got to figure out how do they compete in this new particular arena to where you're not just dealing with the secondary market, which used to be like DVD and then like the HBOs. Right. Now you're dealing with the fact that a person's going to make a movie and push it straight to an on-demand platform and they're going to bypass the theater. 
So that's right. what we want to look at is that if you're looking at the theater stocks, I know Cinemark uh, had kind of moved up a little bit later and people still looking at AMC is how do they compete in this new space? So once the pent up demand is exhausted, everybody now has seen the little movies that they want to see. What does it look like for them come around Christmas, which is another big time for movies, right? Because everybody wants to push now stuff. Disney's telling you, well, we're going to just push stuff straight to our on demand platform as right. opposed to putting it in the theaters. Well, historically, Christmas was a real big time for movies because mm -hmm. when I was coming up, we would always go see a movie on Christmas Eve. So now yeah. this is what we want to look at this new environment. How do you compete now as a movie theater in this new environment to where you're not only dealing with the secondary market, but you're also dealing with the on demand platform? I think you'll get it in some of the millennial city, cities like Austin. Uh, okay. The desire to meet in community, will, people will go out, right? Okay. When you talk about city, towns or cities with, that are very family suburban, nah, they're at a point like like I know the Alamo Draft House by where I where I am at is always gangbusters full. The one okay. over there in South Lamar that's all around families and suburbs, it's like half dead all the time. Okay. And so I think it's um, it depends on the the where they're they were located at really. Okay. Um, and, and then we answer the second part where it says, how long do you typically stay in your option trade? Yeah, definitely. I answered. Okay. I told him that it, okay. it, it was it was kind of dependent. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Um, tech leaps have get, been guaranteed money for me, but they usually take two to three months for a hundred percent return. Exactly. And see, that's the thing is that if you're willing to sit in there and it's a hundred percent return, so there's not a lot of place in the market where you can get a hundred percent return in three months, right? Yeah. Banks aren't giving that at, you know, 401k. So, because Mr. James is willing to sit and he's not looking for a really fast immediate return, he can take a leap, get his 100% return and put that right back in the market and keep going because we know what a lot of these tech stocks, especially like the Apples, they're gonna only continue to expand over time, especially Amazon. Like I told I think Amazon's a 100 year company. Oh, listen, what, this is what I told somebody, I said, if you look at one of the TV shows that I absolutely love is called Bosch and they're okay. going on their last year. Well, people were so like, no, how dare you end the show that Amazon is created a spinoff with two of the main characters that people love on the show. And this is like a high rate quality show. You know, like, listen, you ever see somebody say, oh, did Netflix produced it? I'm like, oh, it's about to be one of the Tyler Perry weeks. <laughs> but when Amazon <laughs> produces it, you're like, they put some money in this. Yeah, they put money into they it. They put some I money in this. This looks good, yeah. right? And so when people say that about Amazon, I'm like, y'all, there's, there's nowhere ever to go but to go up. And people are yeah. like, oh, Jeff, Jeff Bezos isn't there anymore. I'm like, no, no, he's still there. Trust. That man yeah. ain't left the building. Um, yeah. But him being the face of it, that has moved, right? Um, but yeah, I believe I believe you're right on that. Uh, somebody just said, Roscoe said, Amazon has mastered logistics. Logistics, now all they have to do is apply it to different areas of the market. Now, giving a little perspective on the logistics side, Amazon Relay, and they, they partnered with the Veterans SBA, they partnered with um, VA and some other things, and they also partnered like, hey, just come on in. Uh, and what ends up happening is, yes, you'll have a DOT number, you'll have your authority, and you'll be working with Amazon. But if you leave, you have no kind of any credibility. Because yeah. they pretty much said, well, that's a, that's a side thing. We don't care about that. So if you're a person who's like, oh, I'm leaving Amazon, leaving them to go do what? You have to start all over again. Even if you've been working for Amazon for three, four years with your DOT number, it's like you have to start all over again. I feel so, you. So Amazon knows exactly what they're doing and they're keeping some people locked in for the future. Uh, Miss Lady, the show is called Bosch. It's a police show. It's based off the books. Uh, I forgot the name of the books, but it's based off this guy who wrote a bunch of books, but he wrote 17 books. So it's There's like they tried to smash shows. the show into a small, segment and this is the first time you know i am very anti-california everybody knows that on the show um i'm i'm san diego grew on me love it maybe other parts may grow on me but when i watch bosch and they do this view of this house and it shows this area i'm like oh my god i gotta go see la <laughs> but i gotta yeah. see it from the hills i don't want to be down down the, the, the crowded parts i want to be yeah, in the yeah. hills and yeah. that's how good that show was and that's how good uh the book is uh but that's the thing of it, you know, so, but that's the show. Um, what was the other thing I had? I had, um, you know, people were kind of hyping up uh, this past week, which was like 420, you know, yeah, yeah. <laughs> had a lot of uh, pictures of uh, Elon Musk smoking. 
right? And so they were like the best stocks to buy were Tesla, Apple. Did you see that this past week at all? Do you see any of that kind of growth there, or you think they were just kind of blowing smoke? Literally. I mean, Tesla is 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 leading up into their earnings. I believe is Monday afternoon. So mm -hmm. they had a bit of a run. They did sell off, like I said, pretty much the whole market sell off because of Thursday afternoon. That kind of stopped where people thought they were going to go. They thought they were maybe were going to hit 800. Mm -hmm. uh, looking at Tesla, what we want to kind of ask ourselves is that we know that the delivery numbers came in well. Um, what is going to be their revenue? Do we believe them to be profitable? Some people believe that they're going to be profitable. And then what is going to be their expectations um, for the future? Um, I think Tesla is a, a very much a... Um, a momentum stock and a very much a hype based stock. It's really not based on their fundamentals. Mm -hmm. So how do they continue to feed that? And then also, how do they deal with these issues in China? Uh, because the problem with with operating in that particular country is that you have to walk such a tight rope to get along with the government. You always got to be worried about uh, building and taking so much time to build out a footprint there and then having the government eventually just pull it away from you. And so there was a lot of issues where Tesla was having a bad PR uh, issue in China uh, and government forces are not necessarily government forces, but the press started coming after them, which we know is controlled by the government. Mm -hmm. And they had to try to figure out how to unravel that. They would never have that problem inside the United States. Elon Musk would say something on Twitter would be over with. But they had to do a lot of PR and be very diplomatic. So what I really want to look for is that how are they going to continue to uh, roll out their uh, China market? And then how are they going to deal with operating in that particular environment? Because Tesla has already said that they believe in the future that is going to be their biggest market for EV cars, not the United States. And my mm -hmm. question is that if they're going to be heavily, heavily invested in that market, how are they going to manage that relationship with the Chinese government? Because we understand that they're very much a hardball type operation. And if you spend a lot of time, money and energy to build out a footprint there, you don't want to just pull it all up just because you and the government are having an issue. Man, I, we, we, we're not going to touch on it today, but we need to do a future show about the footprint of Africa. There is a book that's on my list because I was in a, okay. at a conference. It was like one billion smiles or <clears throat> I think I'll look up the actual book, the title, and I'll, we'll give it to you in advance. But literally it was talking about how Coca-Cola and um, a couple other companies were like, yo, Africa, 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 Africa. Africa. They're yeah. like, we can have one billion customers. Right. And so they were showing where there was actual like coca-cola refrigerators coca-cola trucks that are riding on these raggedy old african roads you know and it was like and they were saying no matter what you think there's one billion smiles over here right yeah, exactly um, you know you drink a coke you smell and so that's something i definitely want to talk about in the future with you and your thoughts on it um because even now there's a girl's mom i know she moved to ghana and everybody's like miss, miss jackie moved what do you mean? And and it's like almost like mainstream. It's like, oh, she moved to Florida, but she literally moved to Ghana. So, yeah. so two more things I saw this past week, and, and uh, won't hold you up all day. But uh, U.S. cannabis stocks kind of went up because they're like, oh, it's federal. You know, the federal government, you know, legislation coming up, so that's why it's looming uh, their vote. But sixty-five percent of the cannabis industry is medical, and only thirty-five percent is recreational. Uh, I don't care what the governor of New York does, it, you know, it's still federally, exactly. out, you know, and it's almost like, even though they say that for New York, do you know how many people have been stopped in the past five years that have all these little charges that are going to have to go through the system and clear those people out for small time possession? It, it, it's a mess. It's a mess. And I'm sick of cities saying, oh, it's legal here. It really isn't. It really yeah. isn't. You're still going to be stopping people. You're still going to be frisking people. You're still going to be doing things that are, in my opinion, terrible. Um, <laughs> he said Elon Musk said F the SEC on Twitter. <laughs> yeah, exactly. See, now he'll say that, but he, he won't say F the uh, CCP. Uh, yeah, oh, no, no, no. He don't want yeah. that. <laughs> yeah, feel you. Well, even ETFs, uh, sector ETF check, like I love this thing that it does market alert. And it was like energy sector, spider up. Utility spider down, uh, spider yeah. healthcare down, industry spider down, tech spider down. And I'm like, I'm like you guys, I can't even, even though I enjoy watching the stock market, I look at outside world. I go, we're building stuff. Yeah. Utility, utilities are going through. We're building stuff. Solar panels, like Tesla is trying to play it off like, oh, we're here for the space, SpaceX and the Tesla car factory, but they're really here for the solar. I've already okay. seen like four or five houses with the Tesla solar on them. 
and okay. what better market to do that in than Texas? In Texas. Yeah. 300 days of sunshine. Like we literally, yeah. that's our thing we tell people. We're like, oh, Colorado has 300 days of sunshine. We're like, yeah, but it's snowing half the time. Yeah. Here, you know, that's our big selling point. So uh, that's something I think people should watch out for is Tesla solar being really big here. So, um, oh, one thing I thought was funny is the Peloton stock. They're like, oh, Peloton stock is struggling. And I'm like, didn't we talk about that on the show? Yeah. Really? Like yeah. where's Peloton gonna go? Yeah, definitely. We and they had a um, you know, they had a report come out saying that their treadmills were dangerous for children. Uh, ah. which we, we know that we know that treadmills in general are dangerous for children. Mm -hmm. So you don't want to have a child around a tread a tread a treadmill unsupervised. Uh because they're dangerous, especially small children, because they don't really understand that they can really get hurt in the treadmill, they can get caught up in the treads, things of that nature. So they sold off as a result of that, but then I think they're coming up in the earnings really soon. We want to try to understand are their sales numbers and, and their actual ability to fulfill going to still impact them and then also on board with the fact that they had a bad report come out about them now i don't think that report is going to hurt them long term because like i said before is that all treadmills regardless of who they're made by mm -hmm. are dangerous to small children but it didn't help them right yeah. so it didn't help them so what we want to look at is that when they come out with earnings what are their sales numbers and what is their ability to deliver? Now, what I saw today and it was really interesting, I was watching YouTube. If you know, uh, you ever heard of Versus, which is like the little yep. Instagram. They okay, mm -hmm. they have a deal now with Peloton that they're doing Versus Peloton. So I don't necessarily know how it plays out fully, but I saw that on the commercial today that Swiss and Timberland were talking about that we now have a new deal to where we're partnering with Peloton to do Versus via Peloton. So I think Peloton is very much based on trying to build out their subscription platform, trying to create more content, because they said before that we're really a media company. We're really not an exercise company. So if they really focus on building out that media platform and creating a lot of value to where people get the subscription for the media content and they stay there. I think all the accessories can be secondary because I would rather have somebody pay me, you know, 30, 40, 50 a month for five or six years than just try to sell them like one piece of equipment for two thousand dollars. For sure, for sure. Yeah. Lulu Lemons, all of them, all the sports people. Uh, someone asked in the chat, what do I think of VFF? Uh, and that's Village Farms International. Um, essentially, I'm looking over it. There's nothing super spectacular. Some of the news okay. here talks about how shares got slammed 27%. But Damn. getting in cheap, yeah, <laughs> that was three days ago. But getting in cheap may be difficult. So for, for, to me, it's $11. I don't yeah. know how much cheaper they want it to be. Exactly. Is it because it's, it's, it's related to greenhouse growth. Uh, I'm going to look over here at the uh, one month. Okay, so one month ago it was $13. Okay, six months ago it was almost all the way up to 20 in February. And then down. over here, October 30th, it was $4. So to me, I mean, I guess do they expect it to go back down to $4 for them to get in cheap or what are they wanting? Okay, so this is the five-year chart. Can you see it? Yeah, I see it. So the question I would ask is, the person that asked this question is that over their five years, why did it spike and then sell off and then spike up again? And then how come, um, why is it, since it's, been five, it's a five-year company, how come it's never gotten over, you know, a certain price point over the past five years? Because the job of the CEO is to return shareholder value. So how come he's never been able to get that share price over a certain amount over the past five years? That's a that's a, a really relatively uh, good enough time to have a publicly owned company. So what we're not seeing is not we're not seeing gradual growth. We're seeing spikes and sell offs and spikes again. Mm -hmm. So it was found in 1989. Essentially, what I'm seeing is uh, they've been growing crops like tomatoes, peppers, cucumbers under the tutelage okay. of the founder. And I oh, OK. And the company shifted into marijuana a year prior to Canada's legalization in 2018. So 2017 is when they shifted into this. They became a marijuana grower. Okay. Uh huh. Mm -hmm. They're a marijuana grower. Yep. So um, my my biggest thing is everything I read about Canadian grow houses struggle. And, yeah. And that's just you, you, it's hard to compete with American sunshine or South America sunshine. It, it's just gonna be hard to do. Uh, I'm gonna look over at their website. Again, they still either deal with vegetables. Because they've got a lot of this website is yes, vegetable it's all focused. vegetables. Yeah, it's all vegetable focused. So do they still work in that? Because again, tomatoes, cucumbers, peppers. What's the difference? Greenhouse grown. 
Yeah, I think they might still be in those vegetable markets, but that'll be interesting how they get all that to grow together. Investor relations here. Yeah. Um, it's one of the largest, okay. It's one of the largest and longest operating vertically integrated greenhouse growers in North America and the only publicly traded greenhouse to produce in Canada. Okay. So, I wonder I would I would wonder who is there um or do they sell in everything direct to consumer or that since they're a large scale grower, who do they have customer relationships with? And then why why about them being vertically integrated, a vertically integrated grower, why is that important as opposed to somebody that's growing outside? Well it looks like they partnered in Texas here. It says uh, they have a joint venture called Village Field Hemp USA LLC, okay. which is a multi-state outdoor hemp cultivation, and their hemp production is at a Texas greenhouse, which includes 5.7 million square feet of production area. When okay. the U.S. regulatory framework for C CBD becomes clear, so apparently they have the infrastructure built up, but they're not fully 100%. Like they have the place in Texas, but clearly they're waiting on America to change its laws. Yeah, I mean, that might take yeah. a minute, especially especially down south. Oh, yes. Southern yeah. states. I mean, again, I, there's a great guy. He uh, wears a T-shirt every. Um, it's the conservative conference. They have a year CPAC. Okay. He basically yeah. he has a shirt and he's like in the marijuana laws. In yeah, the, and he and he's a sheriff and he's like, it's just a way for us to harass black people. And then he yeah. now he has a new shirt. He's like in the meth and opiates, right? And he keeps he keeps <laughs> changing the shirt, but it's like he gets on the news and he's like, "Y'all leave people alone." Like that's his favorite thing he says. Um, I actually have a picture with him somewhere, but um, yeah, city lights. We went over that. So yeah, uh, yeah. T it says Tesla has huge potential in energy and data. Oh yeah. I mean, literally when I was at the conference. Uh, the one before the last one, it was a woman there, multimillionaire woman. Her son works okay. for Tesla. Uh, and, and everybody was like, well, you build cars? What are you doing, son? He's like, no, no, everybody buy Tesla, buy it. She's like, I don't understand why you're so adamant. He's like, listen, they're mapping the roads with the cars. Yeah, yeah. He's like, the computers are doing a massive data sweep, buy into Tesla. And his whole family's like, all right, son, whatever. And so as she's saying this, everyone at our table is like, right now, making notes, you know, but but yeah, Tesla is going for data and yeah. internet. Like that's a, to me super smart. So, um, but any other things we need to look out for in the market, and, and how can they learn more about options trading for you? From you. Okay, so let's first. Um, we want to talk about whether people should be bullish or cautious, cautious, oh, okay. cautious on Sorry. stocks. Okay, mm -hmm. you all right? So then, what I want to tell people is that one, I would look at the earnings this week. Um, there's a lot of tech coming out this week, earnings. We mm -hmm. want to kind of see whether or not those earnings are really positive and that it did, whether or not they move the market up, especially Apple and Amazon. They have the ability to really push the market uh, because of where they're weighted in the QQQ and also the S&P. Mm -hmm. uh, there's also a lot of consumer based companies that are coming out on earnings. We want to kind of understand uh, the, the, the health of the American consumer and what are these a lot of these consumer based companies. So if you look at the earnings for this week, it's really, really full. It's really, really robust. And it's really, really diverse with all different types of companies. And we want to kind of understand how is Biden's conversation on Wednesday that we believe about how he's going to finance infrastructure. How do we think that may affect the market and also in combination with these earnings? But I would tell people that whether they should be bullish or cautious, I would tell you that if you know what you're investing in, right, and you're very uh, confident of it and you have a long term view, I wouldn't worry about it. If you're trading out of positions on a regular basis, I would tell you to maybe kind of do a wait and see approach. That's not investment advice. It's not trading advice. That's just what I would do. I'm going to myself personally. I don't think I'm going to add any new positions. I'm going to kind of wait to see maybe what Biden has to say on Monday, unless something really happens that's really over the top. Do I think I need to move on it? Mm -hmm. uh, and that's really what I want to see, because I thought the market would move green this week. The S&P was very, very choppy for a lot of different reasons. And so what I think is that a lot of people and you something you spoke about earlier, a lot of people are taking profit. They feel that a lot of these companies maybe have hit their peak for the short term. They're taking their money out. They're going to put their money maybe somewhere else that maybe come in at a later date or maybe look for other areas that they feel are not as topped out or not as top heavy right now. Mm -hmm. They try to move into to find places to get invested, get some type of growth. Uh, the last thing we want to talk about is that uh, we talked about Palantir and somebody was saying that they thought that maybe they were going to move up on Monday. Uh, the thing I would tell people about Palantir is that um, you know, Kathy Wood is very bullish on this company. She's bought a lot of their shares. 
my question is that you're looking at a company that has uh, around a 1.2 billion dollar float. The float has continued to expand uh, because a lot of the shares have been sold by the and people that are internal to that particular company over time. Um, they got around 16 to 18 percent institutional investment, which means that there's not a lot of heavy institutional buy in. So they have a big, big float. But institutions are not really heavily invested in this company. Would it be in a one point two billion dollar float? It's going to take a lot of buying volume to move the float. So I think they're around twenty five dollars. They've been consolidated around twenty five over the past few weeks. It would take massive buys to move the float up. Right. Because of the uh, size of the float and less people decide that currently own the shares that they're not going to sell them. <laughs> so I would look at Palantir as a long term play unless you're a day trader and you want to try to capitalize on maybe a one to two percent move over the course of a trading day. But they've been consolidating around the twenty three to twenty five dollar mark. They've come down from 40 and they've continued to expand their float over time. And so you want to be very uh, understanding is that a lot of times float size determines the, the velocity of that share price. Mm -hmm. Unless you get major whales coming in and buying, it may not be able to move up. And if it does move up, it may not be sustainable. And I think that's going to be pretty much it. So I would tell people, like I said, continue to observe this next week. I'm going to personally wait until around Wednesday to kind of see how the market reacts. And I really want to see how does the market come out on Monday? Are there going to be uh, bullish or bearish based on whether or not they think that body news is going to be positive? And also we see the market still responding to vaccination news mm -hmm. and whether or not they believe that vaccinations are going in, an, in a, a way that the market believes means that, you know, pretty much this whole COVID scenario is going to be over probably by summertime. Oh, for sure. For sure. I think um, when I was in Miami, I saw a parking lot where they were lined up in a queue, like okay. wrapping around in circles. I was like, what is going on over there? I was like, oh, is it COVID testing? They're like, no, that's for the shot. Yeah, yeah, I was yeah. like, they standing in a parking lot? He's like, yeah, most of those people are hospitality. They're uh, work at the Carnival Cruises. You know, this is South Florida. If they want to work, they're going to have to take a shot. And I was yeah, exactly. like, oh, that's crazy. But again, South Florida is tourism based. So you, you kind of like, that's your choice. You know what I mean? Like you have to do some other kind of work. And what was funny is we were passing a Carnival cruise ship and a Norway ship. And then I was like, what do they do? Because they just looked like it was off. He's like, they're probably in there cleaning them barnacles off the bottom. And they're just like making <laughs> jokes about it. They're like, they're like, no, there's a security guard on the boat because people keep doing crazy stuff, trying to get on the boat, do different weird stuff. He's like, so there's a there's a, um, a security on the carnival boats that are parked out there. They're not just yeah. I idly. So uh, Kingston James said Planetaire is a five year plus stock. Don't expect any huge gains anytime soon. Yeah, it's, you know, we have to see a lot of the stocks people are telling me about. It's like, OK, so what's the game plan here? What does this do? <laughs> <laughs> like, like they keep showing me, Erica, man, you got to hear about this stock. I'd be like, OK, we'll do a show on it, but you need to give me some more information. Like, what is this? Yeah. What's the point of this? So, yeah. Um, and if you if you notice all of those hot stocks are like under fifty dollars. Exactly. There's a reason for that. There's, yeah, a there's a reason for that. There's a reason for that. Yeah, they're all like under fifty. They can yeah. they get they stimmy check in there and get yeah. ten spots. I mean, yeah. <laughs> um, it's, it's, this guy the other day was talking about copper, and I was laughing because I was like, I have a bunch of copper I bought, like you know, and give it to my nephews, and they were like, man, copper prices are through the roof, and so I went to go look. I'm like, how much is copper price? It was so cheap, you know. So what I realized is like the average person, if they're talking about investing, they're not talking about uh, a lot more than a hundred. You know what I mean? They're, yeah, just yeah. Not, they're not. And so I, I, copper pricing is like dirt cheap. I don't even know how. Like scrap metal per pound is like three dollars. Tubing is like three dollars. Super cheap. So um, in, in comparison to lumber, pennies on the dollar. Yeah, yeah, right? yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. And I, I, I saw you, and I saw you post that your yeah, lumber has been spiking for a minute that's going to be interesting to see how that affects like the home building uh industry well there's a lot of lawsuits going on right now okay. in the home industry and you're going to see a bunch more lawsuits because here in austin they've gone from hey whatever you want to build design we're going to do it we're going to build it up do it right girl now they're like look we're going to build the same basic five six seven eight houses and y'all have to lottery bid them okay. and and the state was like hold on stop playing y'all not going to do that because you got all the people coming from California, so they don't have a need to make, you know, homes built custom to you. There's like not yeah. even an assignment anymore because they're like, oh, we'll do the lottery. Oh, there's a year away. We don't care. 
And because they're expecting the growth of Austin to continue, and everybody knows I was trying to buy this house, and it kept dragging out and dragging out. And they're oh, it's COVID. No, it's this. No, it's that. And I'm like, we were already supposed to close before COVID, and it ended up being the home buyer went under, and they had okay. to sell to another company. And so when the other company came in, they literally gave us like three days. Hey, you got to close on this house right now, or you lose it. And you're like, what? They're like, that's your choice. You have to close right now, or you lose it. <laughs> and so there's a lot of shenanigans going on. And if you saw Pulse Homes. They're okay. being sued right now for like $3 billion where mm -hmm. just faulty materials, cheap materials, um, even here in Texas, a lot of legal labor and okay. you'll go out to the job site and nobody has a hard hat on, nobody's got any gear on. And so what I would used to do is I used to pull my car up and like take pictures of the house and they would be looking like they start putting yeah, hats yeah. on and stuff. And I was like, what is wrong with them? They're like, oh, they think you're from the city. They're like, the city always sends black women. <laughs> <laughs> And so um, you're going to see a lot more lawsuits, right? Because okay. it's not going to be it's not going to be cheap anymore to fix the house. Like let's yeah. say they're messed up and they have all these warranties for 45 days. Well, now that lowers the cost of this. Yeah. yeah. Are they going to honor their uh, repair repairs? So yeah, it, it to me we can go into a whole conversation about hyperinflation because I, I used to love Ron Paul. Love yeah, it, yeah, yeah. right? Yeah. I, I was all like libertarian. <laughs> Um, but there is something to be said about the fact that we don't add uh, rent cost into inflation calculators and we don't add a particular food cost. Well, what are the yeah. two things that have grown the most, changed the most, and will affect you the most? Food when you buy food for you and your children exactly. and the housing where you live. Exactly. So, so to me, the inflation numbers are completely off. So, yeah, they uh, are. But everybody, I put Dave's course inside the chat here. I'll put it also in the description. I'll also mail this video out to our other audiences and other pages. Uh, thank you so much for being on here. And hopefully this week it won't be crazy. You know, Joe Biden, I just want to see the speech. No falling down. Yeah, I want to see a speech. <laughs> I want it off camera. I want him, I want him talking off the cup. Like, I think I saw Trump somewhere talking. And he was just like, blah, 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 blah. And I was like, there's no teleprompter on that man. He's just saying whatever he wants. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. Yeah, definitely. I miss I miss that entertainment, and I think the stock market does too. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, he is he back on social media? He's off. Uh, no, he he's been doing some interviews here and there. Okay, okay. But, but if, they, if Twitter gave him that Twitter back, oh, yeah, 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 they'll give it back to him. <laughs> they need that. They need that boost. So exactly. <laughs> he's good for business. Yeah. <laughs> okay. All right, you guys. This is your girl Erica from Just Province, and this is. Tell them where they find you at, Mr. Dave. This is David W. This is David W. Williams, also known as Diamond Dave. You can find me on YouTube as Diamond Dave. You can find me, I'm sorry, you can find me on YouTube as David Williams. Um, you can find me on Instagram as Diamond underscore Dave. And you also can find me on uh, Facebook as David Williams. And so I really want to connect to you. Let me know if you have any questions about the market. Let me know if you have any questions about the options market. And I'm also going to be doing some videos on Erica's channel. We're going to start trying to put a little bit more content up there so you can try to understand it. We're going to answer the specific questions that you have about the market, which is going to be one, uh, how to play the options market, how to be successful, how not to lose money in the market, and then also how to swing trade as an options trader. So really look forward to adding content to that platform. So I wanted to tell you to start looking for more content on her particular channel. I think it's called um, Just Stocks. Profit. Just Stocks. Just Stocks. So looking for more content on the channel. And then I really appreciate y'all coming out today. All right. Thank you, guys. People are saying great show. Love this. Okay. We'll see more content here. All right, you guys. All right. Talk to you later.